Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. It's great to come to you again to bring you another Bible study, and hopefully this will be a blessing to you. Uh, I thought it'd be good to start off this morning or this afternoon to have a, a prayer and ask our Father for healing in our world. We've been going through a lot of things in the last couple months um, worldwide, and in the last couple weeks there's been a lot of bad things happening in our country that um, are shaking everybody and um, a lot of um, bad feelings are are out there um, through the people and it's very, being very divisive. So I think it'd be really good for us to go ahead and start with a prayer and then we'll s jump into the, the Bible study. Our loving Father who watches over us and provides all that we need. We thank you for loving us unconditionally and providing us the grace that is beyond our comprehension, knowing that you can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or even imagine. Father, we are struggling and hurting badly in our country and in our world right now. We pray, Father, that you would provide healing to our world we know that the evils of this world can be overcome by your love. And we know that you want us to be your light and reflection into this world. To do this, Father, we pray and we ask that you give us your eyes to see the world the way that you see the world. You do not see us as what color we are. You do not see us as what ethnicity we are. You do not see us as where we are from. You do not see us as male or female. You do not see us as what our worldly status is. You only see people who you created and who you love unconditionally. Help us to see people the way that you do, Father. Stir your spirit within us so that we will treat everyone fairly, equally, with love, compassion, and dignity and help us to have the courage to stand up against injustice and inequality in our world, and help us to protect others from evil intentions. Father, we are broken people living in a broken world. We turn our lives over to you so that you can use us for your glory. We pray, Father, that we will make a difference in this country and in this world for you through your son's amazing wonderful and holy name amen all right so we've just completed a study on living the lord's prayer hopefully that was a a good study for everybody given us uh how we should live our lives based on how jesus presented that prayer and uh, the terminology and words used in the bible that class. Um, we've completed that one as well. Hopefully that was useful for you as well. Um, we're starting a new quarter, so we're going to jump into a book that's called The Jesus I Never Knew. It's based on a book by Philip Yancey. He's a, an excellent writer. This book is <clears throat> really, really good, in my opinion, worth reading. Uh, so I encourage you to, you know, look for this book, read it, um, I would certainly be glad to let you borrow my book when we're done, do, done with this study because I think it will really touch your life if you take the time to read it and really put some thought behind the Jesus that we've never thought about in certain ways. Today we're going to cover the first two chapters in the book. The first one, the Jesus I thought I knew, and then the second chapter is the birth, the visit to the planet. So with that, um, sorry about that. Get my screen going. Okay. So when you were growing up, what were some of the images that you had of Jesus? Now, if you went to church um, and went to Bible classes, you probably remember flannel graphs being used, right? I remember those being used. The teacher would put the little characters onto the board, and you could move them around as well. But that's some of the first things that I remember of in Bible class and learning about Jesus and the other characters in the Bible through the use of those flannel graphs, right? But when you think about Jesus and the image that um, you thought about when you was young, was it like a gentle person holding a sheep in his arms or 
um, with a child on his lap that he's you know loving on? Was he almost like a Mr. Rogers type person who was always happy and genial and um, always helping other people to do the right things? Was it a picture of his arms outstretched above the world or on a cross? Did you picture him as a with a beard and a mustache, a thin person, handsome, you know, or a rugged carpenter, which we knew he was a carpenter? What were some of those images? I looked on the internet, and here's some of the images that you've probably seen many of these. But again, you know, this gentle person is the one that comes forth from a lot of these pictures, other than the one where he's hanging on the cross. And you know, we don't know, but you know, was he tall and thin like this? Um, did he have a beard and mustache? You know, a very appropriate. Um, does he have long flowing hair and things like that? And we'll get into that in a little bit more detail. Have you seen movies that portray Jesus? Most of us have probably seen some. Um, there's been a lot over the last hundred years. Even there were some silent films that portrayed Jesus. <clears throat> And some of them portrayed him very closely to what the Bible um, actually um, says about him, but others were completely off, you know, somebody's idea of what Jesus was like and what he did when he lived on earth, but really there was no um, tie to the Bible in some of those. But some of the people thought of him, though, in the early times back then, I just want to read from the book here. It said, in physical appearance, Jesus favored those who would have been kicked out of Bible college and rejected by most churches. Among his contemporaries, he somehow gained a reputation as a wine-bibber and a glutton. Those in authority, whether religious or political, regarded him as a troublemaker, a disturber of the peace. He spoke and acted like a revolutionary, scorning fame, family, property, and other traditional measures of success. So this is Jesus, a person that uh, lived on this earth over 2,000 years ago. And you think about other people that have made an impact in this world, and you compare them to Jesus, and you say, the impact that somebody had in this world, how does that compare to Jesus? And when you start thinking about that, you'd say, who do I remember, or who will be remembered, you know, 100 years from now, compared to, you know, 2,000 years ago? Jesus had such a lasting effect on the world that time is actually measured by his life on earth, right? Time before Christ, B.C., and A.D., the time after Christ. And this is all from a man who lived a very short period of time on the earth, right? Somewhere less than 33 years. He only taught for three years. He talked and reached a very few number of people during his time. Remember when he lived, he didn't have... TVs, phones, uh, social media, um, ways to spread his message very quickly. He didn't have planes and cars to get around to a lot of people. So you can imagine the ability for him to touch more people in the 21st century is much greater than what he had back then. So with that little contact, think about the revolutionary impact that he had in this world. People even now use his name when cursing. Right, when somebody hits their um, hand really bad and stuff, you know, you don't hear them say, Oh, Joseph Smith, or Oh, Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi, you know, but they use his name in vain in that way. So the fact is, even 2,000 years after he died, you know, we still cannot get away from who this person, Jesus, is. But why is he important? So for people that read the Bible or even believe that the Bible is true teaching, we would go to the, the Bible and would we would look at his teaching, and according to Jesus' teaching, what we think about him and how we respond to him, will we determine what our destiny will be for all of eternity. That's how important he is, and why we really need to consider him, so that we can fully understand what he is, what he needs, and what, what, he, what he, he doesn't need from us what he wants from us in our lives. You know, God became flesh, lived as a man, and learned what it was like on this side, on the human side. And now we, 2,000 later, can only imagine what Jesus was like in the flesh, right? We don't have photographs of him. We were not there 
to see him live. We cannot touch him. We have to rely on what is in the written word and um, what's been written about him. So now we're going to ask, who was Jesus? When you look at secular history, it gives us very few clues of who this Jesus was. There's just not much about him from that time period. I know Josephus, Josephus had a few things in his writings about him. The four Gospels don't even cover the majority of his life, and none of them give description of him. They don't talk about what his stature is. They don't talk about the shape of his body. They don't talk about his eye color, his skin color, etc. And why? I truly believe that those things don't matter. What he came for, what he came for as God in the flesh was to teach us how to live and how to walk and to be like him. Those other things don't matter. We also don't know very much about his family life either. There's just not much written about it. But over the last century, there's been more books written about Jesus than throughout the entire time from his, his death until the last century. And if you took the time to try to read all those books that have been written recently, it'd become very mind-numbing um, to get through all of them and try to get a clear understanding of who Jesus was and who he is. It would be hard. Even Jesus gave us very few hints. He gave us a few here and there about he, who he was. And in the book, on page 23, let me read this. It says, Jesus, I found, bore little resemblance resemblance to the Mr. Rogers figure I had met in Sunday school, and was remarkably unlike the person I had studied in Bible college. For one thing, he was far less tame. In my prior image, I realized Jesus' personality matched that of a Star Trek Vulcan. He remained calm, cool, and collected, as he strode like a robot among excitable human beings on spaceship Earth. That is not what I found portrayed in the Gospels and in the better films. Other people affected Jesus deeply. Obstinacy frustrated him. Self-righteousness infuriated him. Simple faith thrilled him. Indeed, he seemed more emotional and spontaneous than the average person, not less. More passionate, not less. Well, that is a great description of, of what Philip Yancey picked up from reading the Gospels. And hopefully in the study, you will have similar thoughts on that. So now as we start to dig into the different aspects of Jesus's life and the things that he taught and did while he was on earth, let's start this journey now through the book so that we can get a better picture of who Jesus was and who Jesus is today so that you can decide how you're going to answer the question that he asks, who do you say I am? So now we're going to jump into chapter two, which is birth, the visited planet. So Christmas, or Christ's birth, did not sentimentally simplify life on earth. In fact, it was a very scandalous event that upended in the world and it changed it forever. But when you look at Christmas cards each year, what do they depict? Most of them show happy families, sharing meals, uh, beautiful scenery with snow-capped mountains and trees, and cheery animals, right? Uh, deers and rabbits and squirrels all jumping around, having a great time. That's what we see in Christmas cards. But when you look at the Gospel account, it paints an entirely different picture of what we see in Christmas from the secular standpoint. And that's what we want to talk a little bit about today. So consider some of the following things. In Luke 1, it says, Mary was afraid and troubled when the angel appeared to her and told her she would bear a son. Why? Well, she knew she was a virgin, she was unmarried, and she knew that the law said that if she became pregnant outside of wedlock, that she would be stoned. In Matthew 1, Joseph, thinking that Mary had betrayed him with someone else, was going to divorce, divorce her quietly, but an angel came to him and um, uh, convinced him that he needed to stay with Mary and support her and because this was a miraculous birth that was coming through God um, to her. And then Mary goes off to visit Elizabeth and stays with her for several months, you know, to hide her perceived shame of being pregnant before marriage. And imagine the derision and shame that Joseph and Mary 
felt and probably um, was shown from their family and friends. And you can just imagine that some of these people were saying, you know, do you really believe that an angel appeared and said, doesn't it mean this? I think we may be in those same shoes. It would be hard for us to accept that that was the truth as well. So they had a challenge on their hands. Also consider that Jesus was born far from his home. In an animal shed, without the normal celebration of a male Jewish birth, which was a big deal to have a male child, especially the first male child of the family. He didn't have any of that celebration. Everything was resting on these two very young Jewish people who undoubtedly continued to have questions in their mind about what was told to them and if it was true. Can you imagine what they were going through? And what did Jesus' grandparents think? Did they support them? Did they shun them and turn them away? We don't know anything about them, so we don't know, you know, how that was handled, you know, if they felt that love of the family. But through all this, we see that Mary loved and trusted in God and was willing to be a servant through this miraculous birth. And when Luke talks about, you know, Mary cherished these things and held them in her heart, it really shows the conviction that Mary had in her love for God and that she'd be willing to do these things. So why did God choose this most humiliating circumstance for the birth of his son with no pomp and circumstance? It's a good question we need to ponder. And at Christmas, people typically don't think about how the birth of Jesus, Christmas, starts at Bethlehem, ends up at Calvary. When Jesus was taken to the temple, on the eighth day to be circumcised, Simeon was there, and he understood this, and he recognized Jesus as being the Messiah, and he makes this comment to Mary. He says, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And we know that Mary um, did have her her soul pierced, right? Her son was murdered before her eyes and um, being her savior as well, that she was pierced as Simeon had prophesied. And then there's Herod, who is a very unscrupulous leader. He tries to prevent a potential leader coming up against him, right? He implements and infanticides, infanticide, um, a massacre of baby boys in the Bethlehem area, right? And this is the Herod who would kill anyone, including one of his wives, two of his sons, and brothers-in-law. So he wasn't afraid to go kill a bunch of babies. It made no difference to him. He just didn't want to have anybody that would potentially take over his seat of power that he had. And then Jesus spends his infancy as a fugitive in Egypt. And then when he does come back to Israel, Joseph moves the family back up to Nazareth, away from where Herod was kind of at. Even though um, Herod had died at this point, um, he went back to the more familiar place of Nazareth to you know, protect his son from the evils of Herod's sons that were there. So from the very beginning of his life to the conflict between Rome and Jesus appeared to be very one-sided, and tyranny wins. But when you think about what has happened over the last 2,000 years and whose followers outlasted the others, I think it would be very clear to say that Jesus is the one who wins here because his followers um, and his legacy continues on throughout this world. Now, I want to consider a few things. If Jesus came to reveal to us who God was, Emmanuel, God with us, what does the birth of Jesus reveal to us about God? I think there's four things that we can talk about, and we'll cover those. It's easy to miss the message behind the facts in our secularized Christmas that we have. So not thinking about the secular Christmas idea, let's think about what the birth of Jesus meant and how that um, reflects God's character to us. So the first thing, 
that shows us that God is humble. Typically, you don't assign that term to a god or a king as being humble. But I want to read this paragraph out of the book. Before Jesus, almost no pagan author had used humble as a compliment. Yet the events of Christmas pointed inescapably to what seems like an oxymoron, a humble God. The God who came to earth came not in a raging whirlwind nor in a devouring fire. Unimaginably, the maker of all things shrank down, 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 so small as to become an ovum, a single fertilized egg, barely visible to the naked eye, an egg that would divide and redivide until a fetus took shape, enlarging cell by cell inside a nervous teenager. Immensi immensity cloistered in the, thy dear womb, marveled the poet John Dunn. He made himself nothing. He humbled himself, said the Apostle Paul more prosaically. So we see that when God sent his son in this method, that he did it in a humble way. And remember that the Jews were expecting. They were expecting a king like David or Solomon and to bring Israel back into all of its splendor that it used to have. But that's not what God had intended. The Messiah showed up in the glory of humility. He shows up to a poor common couple, born with more animals around him than humans. Nobody to celebrate his birth with him. He needed someone to sustain his life as a baby. So we know babies cannot live on their own. Angels notified shepherds to celebrate the birth, which is very fitting that God would select these people to celebrate the birth with him. Because Jesus was the one who would become the friend of sinners. And we know that shepherds were very considered the low of the low um, of common people. Uh, you could not trust them. Uh, their word was not accepted. They could not uh, appear in court as a witness for somebody. So God, using them to celebrate uh, the birth of his son with him, is was well, unimaginable to the rest of society at that time. So we see a stark contrast to what we know and see of royalty throughout the ages and ages and even today. Jesus did not have any of that. He was brought up in a poor family and uh, with no um, royalty around him. And sorry about that. Okay, sorry. So the second thing that I think the birth of Jesus reveals us about God is that God is approachable. In most religious traditions, fear is the primary emotion when approaching God. Even to the Jews, they felt that. Based on the history, when you read the Old Testament and the temple worship requirements, right? No one could go into the Holy of Holies except one person each year. Um, if you touched the Ark of the Covenant, you would die. If you did not look up into the snake after you got bit, you would die. You know, so they had a lot of fear of some of the things that happened to them because of their disobedience. But God surprises them by coming in the flesh as a baby, because everyone can relate to a baby without fear, right? Everybody says, oh, the baby's so cute and cuddly, and they want to hold him and get close to him. And that's what God wanted. God wanted us to be able to get close to him and to know that he is approachable. God made Jesus like us so that we could feel like we could approach God without fear. The third thing that the birth reveals to us about God is that he is for the underdog. When you talk about underdog, what does it bring to mind? It brings to mind those who are most predictably the one that's going to lose the contest, right? Or the victims of injustice. When the world seems tilted to the rich and powerful, God tilts it towards the underdog as shown in the birth of Jesus. Jesus is taken to Egypt to live as a refugee, a stranger in hiding from his country's government. Does that sound like what you would expect from the Messiah or a king that's going to take over? How could that be the Messiah that was promised? Growing up, Jesus was most affected by the poor, the powerless, the oppressed, i.e. the underdog. God arranged the circumstances in which to be born on this planet Earth without power or wealth, without rights, Without justice, God is there for the underdog. The fourth thing that the birth of Jesus reveals to us is God is courageous. He had courage to bring his son into the world as a baby, laying aside his power, 
and glory to take a place among humans. Knowing how people on this earth treated each other and the skepti skepticism that would follow showed that he had courage that this could, have be, this could be done even though the world would not accept him. He showed courage by having born to commoners with no wealth, fame, or power. Who would ever think that this would be the king? A messiah coming from Galilee? Wouldn't a messiah come from Jerusalem? Or a priestly family? A carpenter's son? That just doesn't make sense to the, the Jews. And from Nazareth? Remember it talks about, does anyone good come from there? So Jesus coming from Nazareth, being a carpenter's son, not from the Jerusalem area, that's not something that the typical Jew would have thought where the Messiah was going to come from. And then also the Jews were the people who continuously rejected the prophets. God had courage that his plan would work even though the people um, could not always be counted on to follow his will. So God had courage seeing his son born that night with all the hopes and fears of the entire world resting on him. So we see Christmas from our earthly viewpoint. Revelation 12 paints it in a completely different light. And I'd just like to read this in closing. A great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, and an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into this wilderness to place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care for 1260 days. So Jesus, he came to be born on this earth as a human. And when that happened, an all-out cosmic war broke loose. And it's still occurring today. So we have struggles and problems that we struggle with in our physical life and deal with. But we also have the spiritual world around us that has this war going on as well. And we're constantly in this tension between the physical and the spiritual and dealing with both of those things in our lives. God understands that, and that's why he sent his son, so that we would have the hope that we would be with him one day. I hope that this lesson was uh, good for you. Um, again, I'd encourage you to read the book if you have it, uh, read it again, and we'll continue on this study over the next several weeks. And um, with opening, we're starting to open up the service now, so we'll be looking forward to seeing people um, very shortly. And we know some people will be staying at home for a little bit longer, which is fine. Uh, but we are truly looking forward to seeing you all once again. So let's close out with a prayer. Father, we thank you for your son, for sending him to this earth to be born to Mary and Joseph and to have that miraculous birth take place and to turn the world upside down through that birth and through his life on this earth and the death that he um, went through and the resurrection that uh, allowed him to have victory and new victory over the Satan and his evil. Father, we thank you for having the courage to do this. We thank you for allowing us to approach you. We thank you, Father, for being, showing us how to be humble and to remain humble in the way that we live our lives towards other people. And Father, we thank you for always being there for us and rooting for us, knowing that we cannot do this on our own, that we need you to be able to get through these times and through this life. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Have a great day.